You don't have to talk loud. Can I have your attention? I want to I want to introduce our next speaker. It's going to be Jessica. Oh, Alan told me to. I know she did. I have to stay here. I appreciate that. I I appreciate that, Cole. <laughs> okay. Um, well, exactly. So, you know, we won't discuss how I have to follow Dr. Paul. I'm not really thrilled about my position in the program, but it is what it is. Okay. So, um, as Cole said, I'm Jessica, and uh, I'm a mom, as you all know, of a child with Jacobson syndrome. But before that, I um, was a teacher and I taught children with autism and I became a board certified behavior analyst. So, that was what I did. And then I was blessed with Petey and you might find this funny. He was literally one of the most behavioral children I've ever had. Like, in, it's, it's just ironic and uh, go ahead. <laughs> so that's okay, he'll, he'll be back. Um, <laughs> you see, he takes, he's, he's very clever. He waits until he knows I can't go after him, and, you know, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> That was not um, an accident. Anyway, um, so I'm no longer a board certified behavior analyst. I let that go. You had to take uh, credits, you know, to maintain that certification. And during the pandemic, um, I let it go. Once I had PD, I stayed at home for 15 years. And um, I just went back this year. Um, my husband's been home since 2020. And I think you can understand that one of us had to go. And so it was me. And so he's still home working and, and I'm out working now. Um, anyway, so I guess that's kind of enough about me. I've presented before um, at the conference. You can watch it on video, but Lindsay keeps asking me to do it again. <laughs> I told her they don't need to hear from me anymore. Um, so I try to change this one up a little bit. So it's like at least slightly different from that, which is on the video. It's going to be really casual, like kind of us just having a conversation. You can interrupt me and ask questions. And um, I'm not going to speak in like the behavioral terminology that I you know, learned in my coursework because I, I don't think that that's going to benefit us. I think I just wanna to talk to you the way that I talk to my, my children's, my, my students' parents. And um, I wanna help you. And I will tell you though, like I said, Petey is literally one of the most behavioral kids I've ever worked with. And his teachers commiserate with me because they're experiencing it as well. Good job, kiddo. Um, so anyway, I will get started. Yesterday during Dr. Dina Friedman's speech, she said something that like, I quickly, I'm like, Lindsay, give me your, your notebook. I have to write this down. She said, feeling understood is a basic human need. And I thought it was so brilliant when I heard her say that. And it really relates to what I wanna to talk to you guys about tonight with the behaviors. Um, as parents, I think we fixate on the behavior. Who does that? Do we all do that? We say, oh my God, you know, he's uh, banging his head. He's biting his sister. This is happening, that's happening. And what we're doing is we're just talking about what the behavior looks like. Okay. But what I want you to understand is that behavior is communication. So everybody say that with me. Behavior, behavior is communication. communication. Right, it does not matter what the behavior looks like, it's communication. And so that's, I wanna shift your thinking um, because if you think of a behavior as a kid just acting out, you're going to respond differently than you would if you think of behavior as communication. So it's, you're gonna have to unlearn like decades of living with thinking that behavior is acting out and it's you know within their control and i'm not saying it's not ever within their control or ever a choice but in general i want you to think of it as communication so it doesn't matter what the behavior looks like um the way to eliminate problem behavior is to figure out why the child is engaging in the behavior that's what you need to do it doesn't matter what it looks like it matters why they are doing it so, you know, I just don't want you to get caught up in 
in what it looks like. Because when I talk to um, the parents of my students, the first thing they'll start to do is, oh, he's doing this, he's doing that, this is happening, that's happening. And so I have to bring them back a little bit and start asking, okay, well, when does he do this? You know, is it always the same time, um, the, always the same activity, always the same people present? And you really wanna try to get to the bottom of when and why it's happening. So as an example, when your children were infants, how did they let you know they were hungry? Well, <laughs> is, that, is that my Jersey girl over there? Wait, who was, oh, <laughs> okay. So yes, I guess that is one way, but the crying. Okay, how did they let you know they were tired? They cried. <laughs> yeah. How did they let you know that they needed a diaper change? Right. So how did they let you know they wanted to be held? You get the idea, right? So they had no other way to communicate and it was a cry and you had to figure out what that cry meant. It was always a cry, but it meant different things. So many of our children have delayed language or, or no verbal language. So can you imagine if you couldn't communicate your basic wants and needs? I think we all understand like the, like how that would be and, and how frustrating that would be for all of us. And I mean, I just can't imagine. And so that's why as an educator, um, when I see children who don't have a voice, meaning that they cannot speak verbally, no one's ever taught them sign, no one's ever given them some assistive technology. No one's given them pecs. You can't hear me. Sorry. Thanks, yeah, Cole. Good thing you're here. I was shutting the mic. Okay. If, if they have no way to communicate, I'm like, stop everything. That's what we need to work on. I don't care if they can touch red. I don't care if they can show me blue. What we need to work on is a way to communicate. So as parents, if your children are in that camp, please, at the next IEP meeting, or better yet, like call one now, that needs to be the priority. If your child does not have a way to let you know their basic wants and needs, what do you think you're going to see behaviorally? A lot. And you can't blame them, can you? Because you can't exist and not tell people like, you have a headache, you're hungry, you're just done with this room and you need a break. I mean, anything, you, you have to have a way to communicate. So that just has to be number one in terms of like any early intervention, any language, like based preschool, anything you're doing, it has to be expressing basic wants and needs more than anything else. That's really what I, I just want you to take that away today, if nothing else. So, okay, sorry. Okay, so according to applied behavior analysis, which is the, the science of behavior, there are four basic reasons that people would engage in behavior. Okay, so the first one is that um, you want attention. Okay, so, and it could be good attention, it could be bad attention, it could be, you know, anything you can imagine, but attention. And, um, you know, sometimes I remember my mom, you know, would say, oh, he's just looking for negative attention. And that might be the case, but he's getting it, isn't he? he when you're yelling at him and telling him to stop doing something, he's getting attention. So right off the bat, if that's your strategy, when your child is engaging in negative behavior and their, their function, their why is attention, well, you're gonna maintain that behavior because you're giving them exactly what they're looking for. Even though as like, you know, an adult, I think, well, why would you wanna get yelled at? You know, that doesn't sound like fun, but think about it. Like I just stopped what I was doing in the kitchen and I came in the living room to yell at the children for, you know, wrestling in the living room. They got my attention. They got me to stop doing what I'm doing, turn around, come in there and give them attention. So that's one way. Um, sorry, this is gonna keep dying on me here. Okay, the next one is escape also. Um, if you are sitting you know, in a room, um, for example, and it's really loud, it might not bother you, but your child might be bothered by the loud noise. Um, you could be in a crowd and that could, you know, trigger something in them. You could be um, just somewhere something might smell funny and you might not notice it, but they do. So any reason that they might want to escape. Now for right here, um, that would be math class. It's hard for him. There's just no two ways around it. And he's at school. So what does he have to sit through? 
math class. I get phone calls. Oh, Mrs. Spaghetti, we need you to come, you know, pick up Pete. Why? What's going on? Oh, well, you know, he's he's causing a disruption during math class. I'm like, no, that's your problem, not mine. Like, you have to handle that. I'm not coming to get him because that's escape. And he wants me to come and get him. I will not. So we have to teach him how to communicate and say, this is too hard. I need some help. Can you show me an example? But if we just keep allowing him to have a behavior and then we drag him out of the class so he doesn't disturb all of the other kids, we gave him exactly what he wanted. And sadly, that does happen. You know, it's, and I get it because you don't wanna disrupt everybody in the class, but that's why it's really important to work on this beforehand and give him the tools and, and the words to escape it appropriately, either to ask for a break and say, I need a break before I keep going or to say, I can't do this, this is too hard. So you wanna give them the words, that's really important. Um, the next one would be access to something. So it could be like two kids fighting over the same push ball or you know, the same video game or you name it. It's, a, it's like access to something that they want. And I think anyone who either grew up with a sibling or has more than one child can really understand like how this plays out. So a lot of times my strategy when the kids are fighting over something, I grab it and I said, well, you've all just lost it. And so now that's that. We're not, we're not even going to have this conversation. You know, you thought that you wanted a little bit extra time on your PlayStation and you couldn't even give your brother a turn. Well, now you've just all lost it. And that's, that's where we're going with that because I won't allow you guys to have this big argument in the house and then still get that which you're fighting over. Like we're not doing that. But again, sometimes as parents, we just wanna end it. So we do whatever it takes to just end, you know, the fight, the yelling, whatever. Then the last one, this one's the hardest one. It's called automatic reinforcement. And that is a behavior that feels good to the individual. So there's really not much you can do because it, it's, it's self-satisfying. So um, like that would be, sometimes you might see a child and they're doing what we call like stimming. If they're going like this and they're just watching it or you know maybe pulling their hair or doing this or you know some other things, which we'll talk about more tomorrow with Dr. Cicero. So I'm not gonna go into like masturbation or anything like that because that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> so um, anything though that feels good to the child that they're doing and that you might consider a behavior. The, the way to like squash something like this is to teach them that there's a time and a place for something. And you want to teach them, okay, well, if you, you know, want to do this, you can do it, but only when you're sitting at this table, you know, in the classroom or only when you're in your bedroom or, you know, something along those lines, because if it's something that feels good to them, there's really nothing you can say or do that's going to stop them from doing it completely. You just want to teach them an appropriate place to do it and that it's not, you know, maybe on the subway or, you know, what have you. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Yes. Of course. Um, what would you say is that behavior that feels good to mm -hmm. our children is self-destructive? So for example, Charlotte um, likes to, to bite herself mm -hmm. and she bites till she actually gets um, active. Okay. She can be ruined and she bites. The inside of her, of her arms. Okay. Until she bleeds. Well, I would say a couple of things. Are you sure that she does it because she likes how it feels? Because she could do it because she gets attention for it. Like when it happens, of course, it's upsetting to us to see um, behavior where she's hurting herself. So she might get a specific reaction from adults in her life when she does that. If it's actually that she likes the way something like that feels, um, I've used things before and I can't remember the name. I, I'll look it up and get it to you though. Like a, a, a stick that they would chew on. It's like hard rubber, like to give them a replacement basically of something that will give like a similar feeling, but not, you know, hurting herself. And every time you would see her like show that she's going to do that, you would quickly have to give her the replacement and encourage her when she's doing that. Unfortunately, I don't know if there's anything that would feel exactly like that, if that's what she actually likes, but that is um, what I was going to go into next. So you're, it was a nice segue that <laughs> we're going right into that. Yes, Dean. Yeah. 
Oh, I think so. I think it's really common in the disability you know, community in general that um, it could just be that they feel like they need the input. It, it could be as simple. Yes, the, the sensory um, need to do that. So we have to give them an appropriate way to express that and to like get that feeling so that they're not doing something destructive or something you know, self-injurious because it's heartbreaking to watch your child um, do that. And you know, a lack of using my own child as an example again, um, he wanted my attention. This was years ago. I mean, I think he was two or three and he knew how to get my attention and he wanted to headbutt, but he didn't want to hurt himself. And so he jumped up on the couch and did it on a pillow. And I said, he is too clever. Like he realizes I want her attention, but I don't want to hurt myself because he probably did it for real one day and like realized that, you know, that hurt and he didn't want to do it. Whereas our kids, unfortunately, seem to have a really high tolerance for pain. And so that brings a whole new, when you combine that with the bleeding disorder, I mean, it's a really dangerous combination. Um, but looking that like something like, if people saw him headbutting, they might have just assumed, oh, he likes how that feels. Well, in his case, he didn't like how it felt. He wanted my attention because that was his thing. And he knew if I do this, you know, she's, she's going to come running. And they're usually right because when they're doing something that will hurt them, we have to intervene. You can't like turn around and ignore that. You want to get involved and prevent it. So I would say that there are times it might not be a feeling that they like, but it could be that they have that need to chew. And, you know, I know he can't chew gum. So I don't know if, if your kids are in the same boat there, but it's just not something he can do. That would be like a really great substitution if they could chew gum or like a starburst, even though the dentists would hate that idea, just giving them that like sensory input. Um, but again, these like, they definitely make these and, and you could find them like in OT catalogs and whatnot, where there are things that you can chew on. And, you know, you can probably even like an OT would say like maybe massage. Um, Joy might be able to help me with this, like, you know, massage their mouth or, you know, like yesterday um, with Dr. Friedman is going over and the, the tapping and the, just to give them input in other ways, I think would be really important. But it's also sometimes, sometimes we're spot on when we think we know why a behavior is happening and other times, like we think it's one thing. And then when data is actually taken and, you know, it comes out like something else, you're like, wow, I had no idea that's what was going on. Um, so let me... See, okay. All right, so once you can identify the reason your child is engaging in the behavior, you're gonna find the replacement behavior. And you want to then try to encourage that behavior anytime the child would normally engage in the negative behavior. But you want it, it, ideally you would get in there before they start to engage in the behavior. Like if there are precursors that you're aware of and you kind of know, oh, this is about to happen. That's when you want to jump in and you want to try to teach them this replacement. So how do you do that? Um, you really don't want to reinforce the negative behavior. And it's so much easier said than done. It's really easy for me to stand up here and say this to you. And it's another in the moment to actually do it. But if you know that your child is looking for your attention, and they throw themselves on the ground in the middle of target, even something as subtle as your eye contact is attention. And so it's, it's really hard because they have a way of like doing it in the middle of the target and you're like embarrassed and you just wanna get your groceries and go home or you know whatever. And, and it's hard because you can't always be on, okay? I, I'll tell you that as a mother, you cannot always be on. And I, I had so much pressure on myself when he was little because I had taught and I knew these rules and I knew what I was supposed to do. And then here I am in my home trying to just be mom. And instead I'm like, oh my God, okay, I have to ignore this. I have to do this. Like it, sometimes it, it causes a lot of stress and realize you're not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to be, you know, exactly the way it should be. But if you can just try to remember that if you think the child is doing something for attention, you don't want to give them attention for it because even yelling, which you think you're being, you know, tough and scaring them or, you know, whatever, it's attention. Um, if they want something, like if, if they want to escape a situation and then you pull them out of the room so that they're not disrupting everything, they, they, they're escaping. So what I try to do as a teacher, if I know that's happening, everyone else gets to leave the room and go for a walk and that child has to stay with me. And you can't always do that. Again, if you're in like a regular ed classroom, that's really not going to work very well. 
but um, in the classrooms that I'm in, I generally would have like six self-contained, like it's a self-contained classroom, six students. So it's a little bit more flexible and we can do something like that. But it's just so important to try to figure out why they're doing the behavior and then don't give them that when they engage in the behavior. And at the same time, you need to work on giving them either the language or a sign if you're, if you're doing sign language, if you're doing assistive technology, having them just have a way to tell you, it's too loud, I need a break, I need attention, I want a treat, you know, whatever um, it is that they're looking for. Um, okay. Let's see, yes, yeah, so you wanna substitute the socially appropriate language for the negative behavior. And um, basically in closing, I think that teaching a child to request what they want or need is the single most important thing you can do as a parent. And um, using words, signs, assistive technology, pecs, whatever it is, that is the most important thing you can do in terms of their happiness and in terms of um, decreasing behaviors. So I figured I would, that we would be running late, which I guess we're not today, um, but that I would leave this open for questions. So if you have questions now, also this is being recorded. If you don't want to ask something personal, that's fine too. We can talk later about that. I'll be here. Uh, I'll be here until tomorrow. Um, so uh, that is it. So Cole has the microphone. He'll Thank, you, Thank you, Cole. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Cole. And have something for you. Oh my goodness. Well, it's all to you guys. Well, you know I love chocolate, so I'll take it. Thank you. And here comes Wednesday. <laughs> we have a question. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment or okay. just a discussion. Sure. Um, so we did, we started off with four times. Mm -hmm. um, how prohibitive insurance doesn't cover it, insurance covers the VA. We did that solidly for three years. We had 24 hours of, no, 30 hours of services in our house every day, um, four hours a day and on some uh, weekends. Anyway, um, for our daughter, it, they had never seen anything like it. And this was even to the director. Um, they did so many other behavior analyses mm -hmm. they did set up different conditions and there was no consistency whatsoever like her antecedents or her yes. triggers yes were just all over the board um and her behavior was actually getting worse she's trying to commit to something but it was almost like it was internal mm -hmm. it was almost like it came out of nowhere and so we ended up stopping in <coughs> Um, and kind of trying to go back to like four time thing. And what I learned from for her from that experience, and then her behavior stopped. It stopped. And the thing that I just wanted to like impart is I think that this works for, for a some. lot of kids. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more clear for the kids where Eliza has a really amazing emotional vocabulary. She has a really amazing sense of self emotions and how she's feeling but sometimes she doesn't and the her it's like lightning speed to her body she's frustrated or something's wrong mm -hmm. um she has a trigger she acts out with her body um and she's gotten much better but it used to be going after her baby sister which was super unsafe up until even like six months ago mm -hmm. um but what i have learned that helps in the moment, especially in the cases where she doesn't know. If I say it, it, it stops meltdowns so fast, it's like I hear you and I see you and I am here, and it's okay if you don't know why you feel this way. Um, because I think for her, and I'm not speaking for everybody else at all, but I think for her, a lot of it is physical. Um, they've also learned that her ocular motor, she gets very overwhelmed if there's a lot of movement around. Her. And she um, can't articulate. And she can't articulate. She has no idea. She's never done anything different. So just people being around her, even the play date she wants to have tonight, she's like, I want too many kids to be there because all she knows is that when there's a lot of people, she can't control her body, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that could be sometimes.
something to keep in your back pocket just to let them know like this but it's kind of opposite of ignoring you know but it works i spend seconds and it's amazing. but it might not be for attention it doesn't sound like right. she's so it's it's totally i think it's brilliant yeah. what you're saying and you're honoring what she's feeling and you're giving right. her the words right so you actually are doing it but it's it, it doesn't sound at all like she's doing it for attention right and and right and so i think sitting there especially when i don't know and she doesn't know and letting her know like i'm here mm -hmm. it's okay that you don't know i'm here until you don't need me you know like it goes away it's amazing i'm so, so glad you figured that out <laughs> i know that's um, I, I so. it's hard to watch your child have a meltdown there's yeah. um it's hard to watch any child but when it's your child it's like you feel it and um i think that's a really brilliant way to let them know because clearly she doesn't have the words to tell you what is happening inside and um i think that's a wonderful strategy Jessica, thanks for talking to us. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. Um, you know, Megan is almost 34 and behaviors have become, you know, better in some ways um, and worse than others, you know, as she's getting older. But um, we've had an organization um, called START, and I, they're available in some states, I think, but they specialize in people with developmental disabilities and mm -hmm. mental health issues. Amazing. And, uh, and they've actually um, come out and they've done some really good training for us. Okay. Um, but one of the things that they talked about um, were the factors and the vulnerabilities. Okay. Is generally with developmental disabilities. And they talked about um, not only the communication deficits, but executive functioning deficits, mm -hmm. um, the sensory stuff, we touched on that. Um, and, and also just their ability to emotionally Oh, absolutely. That can cause behind those behaviors mm -hmm. that, um, and you know, just kind of helping Megan, you know, focus. She's got lots of anxiety, mm -hmm. um, and helping her to come up with identifying it, and then you know, being able to say, "I'm feeling anxious" or "I'm feeling low," yes. or whatever, and then, well, what do you do when you're feeling anxious? And then maybe having some things that help her. Right. You know, with finding, you know, do I need to chew on something? Is something too loud? Do I need to drink? Do I need to take a walk? You know, those kinds of things that just have a card for her that help her to navigate mm -hmm. that and, and reference, you know. Bonnie, I love that. Like I, I am not a psychologist, yeah. so I, I don't feel um yeah. really qualified to speak it on anxiety, so but awful. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when you are feeling anxious, it's the fight or flight response. And so, you know, no one is going to stop you. If something is happening in here and you need to get out, like, and so absolutely, like yeah. for her to be able to identify that feeling of anxiety right. um, is, is critical. And then what, That's, what, what, what do we do, do now? What do I do now? Right? Because, you know, like, you know, the other children, mm -hmm. she can go and into a meltdown and physically, you know, be aggressive. So. Right. You know, and for her to say, no, I'm anxious, and to be able to do something else. Yes, like what she, Dr. Friedman showed us yesterday, if that could help bring her down, if she could articulate, yeah. I'm starting to feel that way inside, or, you know, even if she's not using the word anxious, then you say, okay, we're going to breathe, we're going to do this, we're right. going to, and, and, and to help. You know, breathe, count to 10, right. walk, count three, you know. Absolutely. And so, I mean, those are just some things that we want to help share. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so, um, Cole's learned um, basically kind of the same thing, but he they taught him um, now 
He just knows that feeling. Right. I'm in the red mm -hmm. zone, whatever, for whatever reason. And okay, what do I do about it? Then? Or I'm in the yellow zone. Okay, ooh, I better, <laughs> better get out of here. <laughs> he's able to then identify that with other people. Mm -hmm. And he'll say, oh, mom, you need to go to the yellow zone. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah. so I think that's really helpful too. It is. It's really, really helpful. A lot. Thank you for sharing, Jenny. So I appreciate it. Not finished yet. So Sit down. The, I was just going to add that the curriculum is called Zones of Regulation. So um, it's, there's um, apps and different things that kids can find to get in. It's a really um, did, did you enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hope my kids have enjoyed it as well. That's and really that's good. Cool. I think those things are cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Healthy mom. I, I teach and that to my students as well. Boom. It's pumped down and that's it. Asking the boom is up. I like that. I think we're going to have to look it up. We yeah. should. <laughs> well, you already know it. Right now. We're going to have to look it up. So if anybody has questions about it, I'm happy to be available. Yeah, that is something that I teach. And then, um, thank you, Joy. To add to this, that something that I um, hadn't really taken into consideration that we were almost all aware of the fight or flight, but uh, I see that um, that my child also encounters treat, and I think that that's something that because the behavior is not overt, that sometimes as a parent, I might miss that too. So that's just something that I'm mindful of. Hope you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh God, I can't read that. <laughs> Can I make it bigger? Or so be Can you read it? So just to be how do you handle about the stress? How do you stress? How about yourself? They might go internal. And so that's, just in that's not a question for me, though, is it? I think that seems like a group question. Wait, Cole, wait, can you bring it back to Krista real quick? And then we'll come to Kim. Oh, I hope I'm not to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my daughter also does those regulations, and I think the things that I said before, I see you, I hear you. Um, that really is helpful when they cannot, they, they know how they feel, they know what they should do, they should breathe, and all of this. Mm -hmm. It's not working, nothing I'm trying to provide is working. That's when I usually do the, I see you, I see that you're trying to tell me something. We're both working on it. It's not working. Yeah. You know, I'm here, and that that's kind of been really helpful. I found is when I just can't break out of it, and I and and physically trying to restrain her. Right. 
You can see the whole, oh. the whole uh, sit down. I mean, well, and I think that would speak to their high tolerance for pain, that, that she's not feeling it. Um, and then, you know, anything with the oral stimulation, I think really is like a sensory need that she probably has. And if you could, you know, replace that with something more appropriate that she can put in her mouth, that she can chew, that wouldn't hurt. Um, as far as the hair pulling, um, I don't know if there's a, a way to give her something similar that she could get that feeling of, of doing that. Like maybe there has to be a toy or something out there where you take it apart. I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to think about that for a little bit, but um, you know, I, it would be more, why is she engaging in that? Like, do, do we think she likes the way that feels or is it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible and, you want to redirect her to something else and, and try to make it harder. If there's a way maybe to put her hair back where she can't get at it or like a, a little hat or a, a headband or something. Um, I, and you can't be with her 24 seven. So it's sometimes, you know, like I said, it's, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, don't allow this to happen. Don't allow that to happen. It's much harder in practice to actually do this. But I, um, would try to find something that gives her a similar feeling if she likes pulling something out um, and you know, telling her what a nice job she's doing, keeping her hands down if, because you wanna talk about, you don't wanna say, don't pull your hair out because just on the off chance that she's doing it for attention, you're, you're talking about it then and giving her that attention. But if you said something that, um, she can't do at the same time. Like, I love how you're keeping your hands quiet or I like how you're playing with the Play-Doh or I like how you're doing this, where it's something that she, if she's doing this, she can't also be doing this. Um, I mean, he's had some behavioral issues that he, they've kind of been like cyclical and they've kind of come and go and then he kind of outgrows them and he moves on to something else. And, you know, that has just kind of happened for us. So um, I hope that finding something that gives her a similar sensation can maybe eliminate that one. There's actually also a disorder that's called tryptophilomania, and it is pulling out your, your eyebrows, your eyelashes, your hair. So um, you can look that up online as well. There is such an association that can help you. Thank you, Beth. And actually, uh, mine was totally unrelated to any of the things that uh, have been discussed so far today. It's just, just for, especially for the, for the new parents, um, one of the things that was really impactful for our family when Elise was little was to talk with Jessica Gay. And um, she when Elise was about two years old, she used to just want to run away from me in the parking lot and things. And one of the things Jessica had suggested was let her earn something that means something to her to be able to change that behavior. So it wasn't like she was trying to get attention or anything, she just wanted to run away. And that's when she didn't want to sit down and you know, on it. So she um <laughs> it was just something simple like she likes to press the button for the elevator from the parking lot. So if she holds my hand, she can earn pressing the buttons for the for the absolutely the elevator. Oh, um, so they think that. So those are the types of things, really um, practical tips that Jessica gave from the previous um, talk that she gave. So if you um, are having any other types of behaviors, really, I would really highly recommend going back and, Thank and you. Uh, watching. The previous um, talks that she's given because they've been really practice. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, that's all on the online on YouTube. I didn't want to just keep coming up here and saying the same thing. I felt like, you know, I hate being on video. And <laughs> um, I think if you Google 11Q USA conference, um, oh, it's YouTube. That's right. Kelsey has updated the website. It will be once you process it. Yes. The previous few conferences are up. So um, it, it's like a wealth of information and it's it's wonderful. Um, I'm not speaking of my talks. I mean, you know, every all the doctors and everyone. Um, just to go back and, and hear it and, and the things that, you know, before you were a member of the group or before you were able to come to a conference, it's really nice to be able to go back and see all of that. Yes, Dean. I have, I have an example of something I did recently with a lot of My daughter was out in the, in the community and there was 
lot of yelling on our part, and it wasn't really kind of fighting with each other. And finally, I'm all, hey, can we do this? Do like this? Like, I'm not talking to you. Why are you rewarding our children? Why are you asking a hot chocolate? No, 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 no. The hot chocolate is for the future. Chocolate was to calm him. Right. And then when the doctor got home, I was able to think that what was just passing out the kids on the wrong purpose and yes, in the first time ever in their life by a zero conference, that was just out of the question. Right. Couldn't find it. And, and it came out eventually. That's the story. But that was a point of crazy devotion. Right. She couldn't articulate that she had missed you. And that, that was what she was looking for. You gave her the words to say, like, I'm, I'm here. You want to spend time with me? And she couldn't actually get that out. But I love that Joy quickly picked up on that. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure that it's for me, though. Um, okay, so how do I um, handle the sadness? worry and stress about his future and do i have any suggestions is, is that a question you mean okay so i think i'm gonna like actually throw that out to all of us because um that's what keeps me up at night um and i really don't need any help in that area at my age so um you know we we try to manage it by planning the best we can for things that we can control and um try to prepare him and you know give him as much of a leg up as we can with everything but um I don't know that that ever goes away. Would anyone else like to help me with that? The self care yesterday was for me. Absolutely, the self care. I agree. No? no I'm just going to say, like, we're, we're relatively new to this. And, uh, like, that's that question right there is like probably the reason I actually. Sorry. Um, all like I can think about is like, what's the future goal? How do we best mitigate it? And like, yeah. what's the plan moving forward? And maybe it's just because of my background, but that's kind of how I think. So all we do is we look at what we can control mm -hmm. um, and plan accordingly. So right. like, and if you have to, like, you, when you look at like a big problem, you just bite off little pieces of it. So for us, like the financial situation, so we're looking to see like what our government is back home. Mm -hmm. contributes what uh, mechanisms are in place for um for investment now that will pay off dividends in the future absolutely we're so young um how are we changing our financial plan to accommodate we're even talking about like updating our wills and stuff to like maybe we have to put more money towards way to raise our other three children that will probably be you know self-sustainable yes right? so yeah, like I, I, I feel that question, and I think everyone here. I think we all do. And yes. like my only like advice, not that I know anything, but is to just like take it one piece at a time, and then just deal with what you can, and not even ignore the rest, but just like don't get too bogged down because it, it, it's like it's way too overwhelming. It is. A problem. So just oh, it absolutely is. And I'm with you. I have three kids, and you know we talk about all the time that um, fair does not mean equal. That's something that we say. And so um, in the end, um, more resources will be left to one than the others. And fair does not mean equal. And he will need more. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, this is something that I think we all are feeling this. And I think being together is helpful because when we have our breakout sessions, you know, we get to talk about this with each other. And knowing you're not alone, I think, is one thing that lifts a little bit of the burden off your shoulders but um i think we're all there so you, you can't see the whole room but everyone's nodding everyone feels um the same way so we share your concerns um beth would like to know where you are located yeah we could link up with someone yes um who's um i think they are yes okay so we have five minutes there we go Thank you. I knew I could count on Cole to keep me <laughs> on, on track and on time. We got five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Is there any more questions? I think that's any more questions? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll have one more. Oh, no. I'll get exactly what the original 
Sure. So, so my daughter is, is now five, but uh, as, as of the last conference, she uh, was 18 months and still not eating anything by now. Uh, so right after that conference, we enrolled in an intensive feeding therapy program, which was based entirely in behavioral psychology. Uh, it, it, was, it was very successful. We went from eating absolutely nothing by now to uh, a little over half. Not bad. But um, it's a lot of hard work. You have to convince this child for whom putting food in the mouth, chewing and swallowing doesn't have normal association with making them feel better. Right. Uh, that, that that's what they're supposed to be doing. And so there's, there's going to be a lot of resistance and fighting and throwing and crying and sweating, etc. Um, one of the biggest hurdles for me in going through that program with her was learning to not react to the growing, the crying, the screaming, etc. Was, was the single best tool that they gave me that I still use in a variety of situations now, even though she's much better about me, is the phrase, let me know when you're ready. And I, I stop what I'm doing, I stop trying to get her do whatever it is that she doesn't want to do. Yes. I just kind of look up at the ceiling or look away from her. They said never, never let that go for more than about five minutes at the most, but in, in practice, it usually doesn't take more than about 20 seconds. She's all back down. It's a brilliant strategy because you're putting the onus of responsibility on them. And okay, when you're ready, I'm ready. I can sit here all day. It's acknowledging that, yeah, you don't do want to do what I'm asking you to do, but you still have to do it. So let me know when you're ready. Thank you for Where sharing that. Now? Well, thank you everyone. And um, like I said, if you have any questions that you didn't want to ask in public, I'm happy to help talk you through it. Thank you. Okay. I still see a few box mills over there, so. <laughs> Get on it. And there's more drinks. Get on it. Because they're going to be bringing it. So, Tom.